Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to talk today. Are you ready? Okay. We're going to talk today about uh, fusion welding or, or fusion processes. And there is an article um, among the articles. And let me just say something about the articles anyway. You don't have to read all this stuff. You don't have to read anything. You're not going to be quizzed on it. Don't worry about it. Um, so some students like to read it. And you should be judicious about it. Um, some of them are kind of review papers and they're kind of general and they're light reading. Others are fairly technical papers. And it's up to you. It just kind of gives you a source. If you ever want to get into something deeper, it gives you a bunch of references. There is an article in there, which is the first page, first four or five or six pages of volume six of the Metals Handbook on, joint, on Welding and Joining. And I was the editor of that first 100 pages, and I wrote those first six pages. And today, you're going to get kind of the introduction to fusion joining processes. Okay? And actually, I got this about 30 years ago as a young faculty member. When I took the course here, one summer from a guy who was visiting from uh, Union Carbide Corporation. That was when Union Carbide still existed. Uh, I'll be able to brighten this up a little bit. Here we, are, anyway. Here we go. And this is actually his plot. I've replotted it other ways, but it turns out you can put all fusion joining processes on a plot, a one-dimensional plot of watts per square centimeter. <clears throat> How many of you have ever had uh, heat flow before? Some of you as mechanical engineers or whatever. And whether you remember it or not, you probably studied Fourier's first law of heat conduction. Okay? And this is kind of what I say, what can you say about something when you don't know anything about it? So if someone asks you a heat flow problem, one of the things we know is the heat, Q, we usually use Q for whatever reason, is minus the thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient. Okay? Steeper the temperature gradient, the higher the thermal conductivity, the more heat you're going to get through something. So copper has very high thermal conductivity. If you have a high temperature gradient, you're going to pump a lot of heat through whatever the, through that copper. Okay. This has units of watts per square centimeter, or watts per unit area. Um, temperature, distance, and you can figure out what the units of thermal conductivity are. Um, it's watts per meter kelvin or something like that. Um, or watts per centimeter kelvin. In any case, um, I, if I want to know if I can melt something, there's two limits. On one end, I have this limit that if I'm not putting in enough heat, I won't melt the surface of my material. Right? Now, it turns out thermal conductivity for most metals varies by only about a factor of 20. Copper has a thermal, uh, thermal diffusivity, um, which turns out Fourier's second law is, uh, let's see if I remember what it is. Uh, change in temperature with time is equal to the thermal diffusivity uh, times the curvature of the temperature, okay? The second derivative. And you can put this in three dimensions and stuff. But the thermal diffusivity is derived from thermal conductivity divided by the density times the heat capacity, okay? In any case, uh, so. Thermal diffusivity is a derived uh, quantity. These are the fundamental properties. And in that chapter, which you've got, there's a three or four page chapter on, on heat flow and welding. Uh, I actually have the only table I know of uh, uh, thermal diffusivity. So most people plot the fundamental K, and then you have to go calculate this. So I, anyway, I've calculated thermal diffusivity for you. Copper has a thermal diffusivity of one watt per square centimeter. Aluminum has a thermal diffusivity of 0.6. Steel has a thermal diffusivity of a tenth. So it's 10 times slower diffusing of heat. 
this is transient heat, this is steady state. Um, it has one tenth, steel has one tenth the, the thermal diffusivity of copper. Copper is ten times more efficient. Stainless steel or nickel base alloys is about 0.05. And plutonium, for all of those who need to know this, is like 0.02 or 0.01. Okay, and ceramics are uh, 0.02 or 0.01. In any case, the thermal diffusivity varies by less than two orders of magnitude. So when I'm doing orders of magnitude analysis here on watts per square centimeter, I can kind of group a lot of things together in terms of the thermal diffusivity of thermal conductivity. It doesn't change that much. And so if I want to know if I get enough heat to melt the surface, it turns out below about 10 to the third watts per square centimeter, I don't put enough heat in to melt the surface. The, a hot sunny day is about 0.03 watts per square, per square centimeter. I, a um, Bunsen burner or a little propane torch. Go tell the safety office I'm running. <laughs> have uh, flames in the classroom, but that's about 100 watts per square centimeter. And you can run your finger through a candle. A candle is going to be about 1 to 10 watts per square centimeter. And I'll tell you later why this thing's more intense than a candle. Um, but, and I can still run my finger through it, but I go a little faster than I do through a candle. <laughs> and if I have an electric arc, I don't usually try it. Okay, because I can't move through there fast enough. But we're going to talk about that because it turns out that at 100 watts per square centimeter, I will not, and I'll give you a demonstration in a little bit, I cannot melt steel with that propane torch. Even though it theoretically might be hot enough, I will not be able to melt it because the steel carries the heat away faster than I'm putting it in. And I just can't. I don't have enough watts per square centimeter. This is heat intensity, okay? Watts per unit area. So at this end, I don't have enough heat to do fusion welding. At this end, at above a million, I have too much heat. I'm putting it in so fast, I, the metal can't carry it away. The thermal diffusivity, remember, only, only varies by about a factor of 100. And if I put it in a thousand times faster than just getting the surface to melt, I'm not going to be able to carry it away no matter what the material is. And I will force the material not to just melt, but to vaporize. Okay? The only way it can lose more heat is not to conduct it through the solid, but to start boiling. Okay? Make sense? So every fusion joining process has to sit on here somewhere on this little one-dimensional graph, between 10 to the third and 10 to the sixth. So this is uh, an air methane post-burning flame at about 100, an oxygen uh, propane flame. That's not oxygen, that's air, but around 500. And I actually gave you a reference. Uh, one of the papers in there is, is uh, some guys, actually the guy who taught me this, that guy who developed this graph. Uh, there's a paper in there where he's measured these things for union carbide back 30 years ago. An oxyacetylene flame, acetylene is C2H2, and we're gonna, we'll talk later about its structure and why it's hotter, will give you about 1,000 watts per square centimeter. And you can weld with oxyacetylene torches. Okay? You can't weld with air acetylene torches, but with oxygen as the, as the oxidant, pure oxygen, you can. An open arc in argon is around 10,000 watts per square centimeter. And you get over here to lasers and electron beams and you can get to a million or even more. But getting to more than a million is not useful because all you're going to do is drill holes. But if you want to see holes, I can show you laser drilled holes. This is a turbine blade. It's been sectioned. This was a single crystal turbine blade. This is the type of blade you'll find in the hot section of a, of a jet engine on the 757 or something. Okay, this is a Pratt & Whitney blade.
It's grown as a single crystal of a high temperature nickel alloy. It's got a, when it's cast and grown as a single crystal, it has a ceramic core on the inside, which is an interesting technology. And that ceramic core will then be etched away in a hot uh, caustic autoclave and it'll leave the, the internal cooling passages because they blow air through, the, through this to cool it down. The combustion gases in a modern jet engine, next thing you gotta remember this next time you fly on a 740, 747 or 757, the gas that's going through the engine is about five or 600 degrees above the melting point of the metal in the engine, okay? And so if you lose your cooling, it's not a good day. However, if you lose your cooling, your engine's not running because they're taking the cooling air off the compressor. So if the engine's running, you've got the compressor is part of the engine. So as long as the engine's running, there's cooling, cooling air going through here. And then they laser drill these holes, or electron beam drill these holes, and some of them are at funny angles. So you've got this 30 atmospheres of 1,000 degree Fahrenheit cooling gas. 1,000 degrees is cool in this case coming up through here and it forms a gas boundary layer that thermally insulates the blade from the 3,000 degree uh, uh, gas that you're using because every every 50 degree Fahrenheit increase in the combustion temperature this was before the runoff in gas prices used to be about two billion dollars in fuel per year for the airlines so today it probably be about six or eight billion dollars a year in fuel savings for the airline for every 50 degrees you get increase in, in temperature of that gas in the engine. So there's a lot of incentive to increase the temperature thermodynamically. But we electron beam or laser drill those at not 10 to the 6th, but at about 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 8th watts per square centimeter. We're putting the heat in so fast that not only do I vaporize the metal, but I get a back pressure that's strong enough to blow the metal out of there and drill a hole. Okay. So again, this plot, anything below this, I don't have enough heat to melt. Anything above this, I have so much heat, I can't carry it away, and I end up vaporizing. And in fact, I will get a very deep penetrating weld, because somewhere in between here, I'm starting to drill holes, but the metal kind of sloughs back in, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is the fundamental plot. Yeah. Uh, off the top of the question, you mentioned 747, 757. Do the the wider, the bigger engine jets, they use a different technology or different? No, it's just a different blade, different engine. Okay, so that blade, by the way, today probably goes for $6,000 per blade. Okay, there's about 100 of them in a set, and there's anywhere from one to four sets. Now you start to realize why the engines cost five million bucks a piece, right? One set of blades is half a million bucks. In any case, uh, there's a lot of technology in, in uh, doing that. Um, the, so everything, we're going to try to relate everything uh, to this type of graph. And whenever someone develops a new heat source, I mentioned yesterday, one of the first things they will do is try to weld with it. So Humphrey Davy discovered the electric arc back in somewhere in the early 1800s. And within one or two years, he was actually trying to make wells. Yeah. You said they grow that thing out of a single white crystal? It's a single crystal. You you basically, it's the same way they make my brass wrap, your, your college ring yeah. or your high school ring. They basically make a wax preform. Yeah. In fact, I, could, I can bring, the wax preforms are fairly fragile, mine are broken. Uh, but I'll bring in some of the broken pieces. But you make a model of that in wax. You just you make a metal mold and you inject the wax and make a plastic or a wax piece. Uh, and it can be, I mean, if I look with a little magnifier, I can actually read Massachusetts through technology that's cast into this surface. You can get very good detail. Uh, the way you take the wax, you screw it up with some other wax runners to make a mold and then you dip it in this slurry of ceramic, and you dip it multiple times. And then you take that ceramic piece of wax, 
and you put it in a furnace and melt out the wax and leave the ceramic mold. Now you're going to fill that, you're going to cast that with some metal, and then you're going to take that and you're going to put it in a gradient furnace. And one of these gradient furnaces costs two or three million dollars. It will grow like 24 blades at a time. And you basically, just like growing a single crystal of silicon, you pull the, you uh, solidify from one direction. It's called zone melting. Okay, and you you uh, melt it in this furnace, and you pull it out the bottom of the furnace very slowly. And if you do that properly, you can get a single crystal to grow. And you don't want grain boundaries because grain boundaries will be weak spots at high temperatures and cause the thing to creep and break. So they've gone to single crystals. But it's a fairly complex process, and you have to do that with ceramic pores and everything else. And the, the wall thickness there is critical. And every one of those blades nowadays goes through a CAT scan to measure the wall thickness. Okay? CAT scan machine is a half million dollar machine. Okay? Brian's working on some of this stuff. I'm going to learn more about some of these things. Um, so does that answer your question? Now, they, not all blades are single crystals. The most expensive, the highest temperature blades are single crystals. You can buy a blade for $2,000. It's just polycrystal. Okay? A little cheap. Other questions? Okay. Um, so anyway, we want to look at this plot. And I don't know if this next one's going to work or not. We'll see. Uh, I actually, this goes back many years. Lecture at the Welding Society. Yeah, that works all right. So this is same, sort of the same plot. It's not Anderson's plot, but um, okay. So let's put that up. So watts per square centimeter, ten to the third, ten to the sixth. That's the range we're interested in. Anytime anyone develops a new heat source, they try to use it for welding. Um, Sir Humphrey Davy tried arc welding in the early 1800s, didn't commercialize until 1880 after Edison and Westinghouse gave us a source of electricity. Humphrey Davy had a bunch of batteries basically to generate his arc. Okay. Um, electron and laser, um, electron beams and lasers came in about 50 years ago. And like I said, the first application of lasers where they're still in the research stage, this is when people still use vacuum tubes in the 1950s. They might make a vacuum tube. It might be a $100 vacuum tube, which is a fairly valuable vacuum tube uh, back in the 1950s. And they find that uh, one of the metal contacts inside the vacuum tube was broken. Well, then you'd have to cut the glass away and fix it and then reseal the glass and pump it out. Well, they found well, they didn't have to do that. The laser, they could just shoot through the glass and re-weld the thing. Okay, So it was one of the first applications. And I think I mentioned, I mentioned yesterday the particle beam weapons. So the Navy had to spend a quarter billion dollars trying to develop these particle beams, basically electron beams, five million volt electron beams that were going to go 30 miles through the air and shoot down the next set vessel 30 miles away. And the only problem was it would only go straight for about 30 inches okay, in the air. Something called, they call it hose, H-O-S-E, like the garden hose. If you had a garden hose and you had water coming out the end, it just starts whipping around in every direction. Well, the electron beams basically did the same thing they found. Okay. Um, so they had this technology that they spent a lot of money on, and they had to report to someone somewhere, and they were saying, what are we going to do with this? And so they had a workshop and wanted to know, could you weld with it? Could you heat treat? They wanted to find some application for it. And so it turns out we found an application. but. The problem with using that for processing at 5 million electron volts, you might know what the problem is? It's a little bit of radiation. You don't want to have, you have to have about two meters of concrete to protect the operators. If you were going to do this in a shipyard, you'd have to have walls, two meters of concrete around what you were welding. It's a little bit, not the easiest thing to build, uh, but in any case. But it turns out, as I go up this heat intensity from a low heat process to a high heat process, I will decrease the size of the heat affected zone. Well, what's the heat affected zone? If I look, I don't know if it'll show up on here or not. It might. So this is a this is HY80. Electric boat made this well, and here this is 
about an inch thick. And this dark area here is the heat affected zone. The weld metal is in here. It's the, kind of the same area, same color as the base material. But the material right adjacent to the melted metal will get to high temperatures. And this fusion line right here is about 900 degrees C. This, this other side of the fusion line is around 1500 degrees C. And this edge of the heat affected zone is the band of about uh, 900 degrees C. And many times, the worst <coughs> mechanical properties are in this heat affected zone. And so you'd like to minimize the size of that zone because it may have inferior properties. So I'll pass this one around if you want to see a heat affected zone. And yesterday I also showed you, and I'll pass this around if you want, just don't cut yourself on it. This is the heavy section weld, and you can see the black heat affected zone. The weld metal's in here, and actually there's a little heat affected zone around each weld pass but you can see the heat affected zone. And you'll see that the heat affected zone by comparing these uh, is a function both of the size of the weld and the heat intensity. And many people will say, will tell you that if you go to laser and electron beam, you won't have any heat affected zone left. You'll see that in the literature, you'll hear it at conferences, it's wrong. It turns out, and this is actually from the paper I was talking about that I wrote, the heat affected zone size, if I look at watts per square centimeter, 10 to the third to 10 to the sixth, it decreases if you're doing oxyacetylene welding. This is arc welding. As you get up here towards laser and electron beam, it starts to level out. You can't make it any smaller. And that's because over here, the material it takes a long time to heat up, and the heat is diffusing into the material while you're making the weld. It gives you a wide heat affected zone. Over here, the heat affected zone is formed as the weld cools. You're melting so fast that there is no heat affected zone or no substantial heat affected zone when you melt, but as the metal cools, the heat diffuses into the base material and produces a heat affected zone. So over here, if you're producing heat affected zones while the, the material is uh, heating, it will be a function of the heat input. Over here, it'll be a function of the weld size. The bigger the weld, the bigger the heat affected zone. Is there a way to control the cooling in order to minimize the heat affected zone? The heat, the heat affected, the cooling is really controlled by Fourier's law of heat conduction in a solid, which is controlled by the thermal conductivity. So no, there's not a good way to control it. But I'll tell you that for developing welding procedures for HY-130, you have to control the cooling rate within very narrow ranges to get decent properties in the heat affected zone in the weld metal, the whole weldment. And in fact, the welding range of heat inputs that you can use with HY-130 make it impractical, okay? And in fact, about 15 years ago, the guys at David Taylor had me go meet with the chief engineer of the Navy at the time because this is when they were talking about building this Sea Wolf. And they were telling Congress this, you know, the Alpha sub had come out and it was an embarrassment to the Navy that the Soviets had kind of leapfrogged this. And, they, and the Congress didn't want to pay to build just another steel submarine. And they said, oh, well, we're going to use HY-130. And the guys at David Taylor knew couldn't do it. Couldn't build a real ship. You could do. You could make laboratory samples, but the problem was they developed HY-130 in the 1960s. They spent 50 million dollars doing it, and there were a certain, a certain group of people in the 1990s who had been part of that, and they were not going to go and say what they had spent 50 million dollars on was worthless. Okay, and so they were pushing HY-130. There were people who were a little bit younger who said, "We're not going to take your white elephant." Okay. And we're not going to be saddled with having to do this. They compromised by saying the first ship would be HY-100. And you can weld HY-100 because it's just HY-80 with a slightly different heat treatment. Okay, so that's another story. We can go through that some more. Okay, yeah. So then if you're basically just by that, if you're arc welding, uh, arc welding pressure, right. if you preheat whatever you're arc welding, would you decrease? You'll, if you preheat, you'll increase the size of the heat effect zone as you 
you've increased the heat in the... Well, wouldn't your heat, by heating it, wouldn't it be closer to the arc welding temperature so that you're not having as much heat transfer through there? Uh, you're or closer, be... but you're actually slowing the cooling rate, okay, which is going to give you a bigger heat effect because the preheat is only like 100 degrees centigrade and the heat affected zone starts at 900 degrees centigrade. So it's the cooling rate that is important in determining the size of the heat affected zone. So you actually preheat increases the size of the heat affected zone. But you can't affect it by any substantial amount because whether, you're, whether you have a difference in temperature of 900 degrees or 800 degrees, it's almost the same, okay? It's hard to, it'd be hard to measure. But so you can decrease the size of the heat affected zone by changing your type of fusion welding process, okay? As you move over here to laser electron beam, you will have narrower heat affected zones, but there's a limit and it's not much smaller. It's about half the size of what you get with arc weld, but it's not, it does go to zero. And a lot of people will say it goes to zero and that just doesn't make physical sense. So, so why do we do the preheating? The preheating, really, well, you'll get into the weldability part of things, but you got to drive off the hydrogen, and you've got to soften the heat affected zone so you don't get hydrogen cracking in these steels. Okay? But we'll cover hydrogen cracking later. But that's it's to avoid hydrogen cracking, which was the problem on the seawall when they had to tear it all apart. It was hydrogen cracking. Um, along with the uh, decreasing the size of the heat effect of zone, there's a number of other things that you can say about what happens as you go from low heat intensity to high heat intensity. You'll increase the travel speed. Obviously, if you're putting it in faster and you're melting faster, you can go faster, okay? And so you can quantify that, which is this middle plot here. And again, you've got copies of this, but the capital, well, forget the capital cost yet. That's another one. Productivity, centimeters of weld per second. This is sort of a maximum speed of welding. But in flames, you can go, with an oxyacetylene flame, you can go about a centimeter every 10 seconds if you've ever done oxyacetylene welding. It's not a fast process. Arcs, you can go about a centimeter per second. You don't usually go quite that fast, but you can go that fast if you have a uh, slightly automated process. And with uh, lasers and electron beams, uh, you can go up here to 100 centimeters of weld per second. I mean, they, they, wind, they weld bandsaw blades with laser with electron beam. Um, the, uh, the best bandsaw blades have a tool steel tip and a spring steel back. The tool steel is very expensive steel. It's got a lot of alloy, take high temperatures when you're cutting. Spring steel is much cheaper, and it gives you the mechanical properties for the bandsaw. You can't afford, and the bandsaw would be very brittle if you made the whole thing out of tool steel, so you just make the teeth out of tool steel, and they actually weld a thin strip of tool steel to the spring steel. So you can have a one inch wide bandsaw blade, but only an eighth of an inch of tooth. It's a high speed steel. They weld that at close to 100 centimeters a second with electron beam. Just bands of steel just zipping through there. Okay? Everything's nice and automated. Okay, increasing heat efficiency. Well, here, if you're going slow, the heat's diffusing off into the surroundings. Lots of time, waste heat. Here, you're going fast. You have melting efficiencies of greater percent with laser and electron beam. Most of the heat is going into melting. Over here with arc welding, the heat efficiency of melting is around 10 to 30 percent, and with lasers and electron or with uh, oxyacetylene, it's like one to 10 percent melting well, for cutting metal. Pardon? We're we're cutting, cutting metal. We're going to talk about cutting in the next couple lectures. Okay, because okay. it really gets a little bit different. Turns out cutting because you're we're going to talk about a gas boundary layer when we get to flames. I'm going to go through each one of these in more detail. This is the overview lecture. Um, when you get to flames, you actually have gas boundary layers limiting your heat transfer. When you get to cutting, you actually eliminate the gas boundary layer because you consume it as iron oxide. So it's a very interesting process, and you actually get about
about 100,000 watts per square centimeter in cutting. That's why you can go so fast in cutting compared to arc welding or something. But we're going to talk about that. Okay. Uh, these are good questions. I don't, don't want to put you off, but we're going to cover some. Increasing need to automate. Well, I actually uh, forgot. It's been a while since I've done this. So there's a there's a a bar room game. I don't know if any of you have ever played it. Um, where you try to see if 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 I drop the bill, the other person is allowed to get their fingers as close as they can to George's nose. Okay. And if I drop it, if they can catch it, they get it. Okay? So if I if the right hand knows what the left hand is doing, I can do it every time. But if it's a different person, there's the reaction time, right? Well, so you can do that with a one dollar bill, or you can do that with a hundred. Can I do this with a hundred? <laughs> this Ben's notes. Okay. I gotta get this right, but sometimes I get sweaty fingers and I release it and the student grabs it. So I'll give you another chance. Okay, the reaction time typically, if you know you're you're doing it, you can get down to reaction times of two tenths of a second. If you actually calculate the pre-fall velocity, it's like 0.12 seconds to go from Frank's nose to Ben's nose. So actually, science is on your side. Just make sure you don't have sweaty fingers. Okay, that's part of the adhesive bonding lecture when you have a little moisture in there. Okay, so that's so it is. It's all joining. Okay, and all gets back to joining. Um, uh, I actually have had students catch it, but it was because my fingers were moist. Um, but um, the point here is. At this heat intensity, the melting time is on the order of 10 milliseconds. Okay, much faster than any person could control that heat, that uh, well pool. The melting time constant here is one to 10 seconds for oxyacetylene. For arcs, it's somewhere on the order of a few tenths of a millisecond. So, I've likened it to. Learning to arc weld is sort of like learning to play a video game and moving up the uh, skill level in reaction time. You have to develop skills. And I have used this to explain why many welding schools will start with oxyacetylene rather than arc, even though you know they're going to use arc welding. But they learn to control the puddle when the reaction time is like the beginner's level on the video game. right? Whereas arc welding, some places start you out with arc welding, but that's sort of starting out on the intermediate level in the video game. Okay, so it's an educational philosophy of you want to teach them what they're going to end up doing, or do you want to start them out on the beginner's level and then reteach them a few things as you go along? Okay, but the increasing need to automate. Once you get very far above the intensity of arc welding, you have to automate. No one can control that low puddle by hand. So it turns out this also increases the equipment cost. And still, for the last 20 years, I've been able to say you could change this watts per square centimeter to dollars per capital cost of the equipment. I can get a good couple of tanks, torch, cart, regulators, hoses for a thousand bucks, order of magnitude. I can get a good arc welding setup. Five or ten thousand dollars. I can get a good laser electron beam for a million bucks. Okay. Now I can get them for a hundred thousand if it's a small one. But if I get one that's going to make comparable size parts to, you know, uh, a table like this, I'm going to need enough automation. the The heat source doesn't cost me but a hundred thousand, but the automation costs me ten times as much. So there's an increasing equipment cost because of this increasing um, uh, need to automate. And this increasing travel speed, we talked about the, the dollar bills, that's the, the increasing travel speed is just the inverse of the interaction time, okay? The interaction time, the length of that puddle divided by 
the travel velocity is the interaction time. Okay? Think of x divided by x over t is t, right? So the, in, the inverse of travel speed is interaction time. Uh, increasing penetration depth to width. I talked about if you can't get the heat out, if you're putting it in too fast, you get it out by vaporizing things. As you vaporizing things faster, you actually have a, a more vaporization and a vaporization pressure. You can, you can estimate a vaporization pressure. And as you get above 10 to the fifth, you'll start seeing a difference in the shape of the well pool. In fact, you'll see a difference in the shape of the well pool going all the way across here. At an oxyacetylene well might have a depth to width ratio of a tenth or a fifth in depth to width. An arc well might have a ratio of close to one to one, to one or two to one or one to two. But a laser electron beam can have a depth to width, width ratio. People actually brag that in aluminum you can get electron beam welds with a depth to width ratio of 100. It's not practical because if you got a depth to width ratio of 100 and you're off by one degree, you're going to miss your joint. Okay? Or if you're off by half a millimeter, you're going to miss your joint. So in fact, about the greatest you ever want is a depth to width of less than 10. But you can usefully use high depth penetration. And in fact, that's what they get when they weld the bandsaw blades or they're welding turbine discs. Okay? But it turns out the if you're going to a very high heat intensity here, you need high production volume requirements. The, if you go and look at where they sell lasers and electron beams for welding, there's two industries primarily. One is automotive. Why automotive has lots of volume. Ford's catalytic converters, the seal weld, they have these two clamshells of stainless steel, and they got a catalytic converter inside there with the platinum. The, the stainless steel clamshell for over 20 years has been electron beam welded, whereas General Motors and Toyota and some others use gas tungsten arc welding, but they will put in 10 machines for one Ford machine. But Ford spends 10 times as much on the machine to make one. Um, so it's a trade-off, but automotive has enough material to keep one of these machines busy. They have such a high travel speed, up to 100 centimeters per second. Think about it. Who has enough volume? Now the Navy has gone back many times to try to figure out, well, can we use lasers and electron beams in shipbuilding? Well, you know, shipbuilding is sort of a job shop operation. You don't have miles and miles of weld in exactly the same geometry going in a straight line. Okay? Now, on a panel line or something, you might, and they have tried to use it in some applications. But a high heat intensity process needs either high volume or high value added. So, high volume is the automotive industry. The other industry where they sell lasers and electron beams for welding is aerospace. Aerospace, the electron beams are busy 1% of the time but they make, in some cases, very high quality welds on very difficult material to weld. And when you're making welds on material that's worth $200 a pound or $1,000 a pound, you can pay for the equipment, okay? So either high value added products, such as aerospace, or high production volume, such as bandsaw blades and automobiles, okay? So if you want to know why do you use arc welding so much, you can do it manually or you can do it automated. You get to beyond, there actually are relatively few processes in here uh, at 10 to the fifth. There is resistance welding and oxygen cutting. I told you we talked about oxygen cutting. I put it in parentheses because it's a little bit different process. But resistance welding, what is resistance welding? Um, this is a resistance weld. Take sheet metal, by the way, invented by L. Hugh Thompson. You might even know who L. Hugh Thompson was. Thomas Edison had 400 patents, number one patent holder in the United States. 
L.U. Thompson had 380. The two of them together founded a company up here in Lynn, Massachusetts called the General Electric. Okay? L. Hugh Thompson was a professor of electrical engineering at MIT. So anyway, you take two big, big pieces of copper, uh, copper electrodes, you bring them between two pieces of sheet metal, you pass 10,000 amps for a fifth of a second, and you make a little spot weld. You just resistance. You heat it by the surface resistance, and you melt it. This one, we've actually pulled the button. Okay, pulled it apart, and you can see pulled metal from one side to the other. I often say, we put 3,000 spot welds in the average automobile because you need 2,000 good ones. Okay? You need 2,000 good ones. They're, it's a very reliable process when it's under control. It's also a process easy to get out of control. So that's okay. essentially a spot weld. That's a spot weld. It's, it actually is called resistance spot weld. However, it's a resistance spot weld. There are other welds. This is a Ford weld on aluminum which is done ultrasonically. There is no heat, there's no current. It may, actually, there is some heat. It's friction, it's ultrasonic friction, sliding friction. If you rub your fingers together, or your hands together, you'll feel the heat. Um, in this case, you also abrade the surface, the aluminum. Aluminum is a problem for resistance spot welding electrically because it has such good electrical and thermal conductivity that you have to put 40,000 amps rather than 10,000 amps. Now you find your electrodes deteriorate. On steel, I can get 2,000 welds before I have to change my copper tips. On aluminum, I might get 20 welds before I have to change my copper tips. And that's just based on the properties of the metal. So basically, spot welding is relying on the metal, what you're welding, to resist the arc passing through it. It's not an arc. It's just electrical resistance. Oh, you're right. squeezing it with like 10,000 psi of force mm -hmm. and just passing a big current for a fraction of a second to just melt it by electrical resistance. So there's the no resistance of what you're, the based resistance, on the resistance yeah. of what you're trying to weld. The electrical resistance, aluminum has very low electrical resistance, so it's hard to generate heat unless you put a big current. And it's also got a surface oxide that's very refractory. Steel is the easiest material in the world to weld, by far. Which is one of the reasons when you do a good material selection lectures, I'll talk about why 95 pounds of all, out of 100 pounds of metal made in the world is steel. And about 2% is aluminum, about 1% is copper. But steel is 95% of all metal made. It's cheap, it's easy to fabricate, has excellent mechanical properties. That's why we use it. So people say, oh, well, I want to build a titanium submarine. Fine, it'll cost you 100 times as much. And that sort of makes some people go, okay? What about make a composite submarine? Fine, it'll cost you 1,000 to 10,000 times as much per pound. Now it'll be lighter by a factor of five. So I divide five into 10,000, it's only 2,000 times as expensive, okay? What a deal. <laughs> but we use it for hoverbats. Pardon me? For hoverbats, we use aluminum alloys, not the uh, steel. Yeah. Because we want it to be lighter. For, for certain military applications and cer certain pleasure craft and things like that, you can afford to use aluminum. But aluminum fabricated will cost you five to ten times as much as steel. You have to maintain aluminum alloys in a range of temperature instead of not breaking. From right. Look, aluminum is great. The, and this gets into the material selection part of the lectures that you guys are going to get from me. Lightweight is important if something moves. If something doesn't move, you don't care what it weighs. It's just going to sit there. But when something moves, you will pay a substantial amount for lightweight. And the faster it moves, the more you'll pay. Okay? It's just one half mv squared. Okay? It takes energy to move something. And if you can get the weight down, you can reduce the energy that's required to move it. Okay? So aluminum is great for an off number of things. Aluminum has better corrosion resistance in many environments than steel. Okay? Steel's Achilles heel is corrosion. It's lousy. Uh, we talk about composites. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought I'd read because I'm from Charleston, you know, they're, they're building, I think it's the Dreamliner, both plant down. Yep. And, Cruise uh, ship. I seem to recall them talking about lots of composites being used now. Are we still? I mean, is, is this is this still 
true that you know um, the you know composites are expensive because the, the joining process is is still expensive, or are we figuring out ways to, to bring it down and, and they're becoming more economical? Composites are more expensive because I have to take two materials, at least two materials, and marry them together, whereas a monolithic material, I don't have that expense. Composites are more difficult to cut because you have the properties of both materials that you have to worry about, whether it's fiberglass or whatever. Composites are difficult to repair as compared to a monolithic material. Uh, they are not produced in the same volumes, anywhere near the volume. So you don't get the economies of scale that you get with, uh, with other materials. Um, a lot of it, as we get more experience with composites, the cost comes down substantially, right. which is what's happened with the 787, the Boeing Dreamliner. Are you talking about the Dream, when you said Dreamliner, are you talking about the, the Boeing aircraft or are you talking about some cruise ship? No, no, no. Okay. Well, that's being built all around the world, pieces of it. Yeah. Um, but the value of a pound saved in an automobile is about $2 over the life of the vehicle. The value of a pound saved in an aircraft is about $200 a pound over the life of the vehicle. So you're willing to spend a lot more in the aerospace industry to save weight because it goes over faster the life of the vehicle? over the life of the vehicle. You figure out the gas price for 100,000 miles on an automobile, and you look at the mileage you know, charts, you'll find it's worth $2 a pound. This is all part of the material selection lecture, okay? It's worth $2 a pound. In an aircraft, it's worth about $200 a pound. In a spacecraft, it's worth $20,000 a pound. You get something up in orbit, okay? But the typical life of an aircraft might be 100,000 hours for a commercial aircraft. And you figure out the fuel savings for a pound. At $200 a pound, they have vice presidents at the commercial airliners determining how many magazines will be flown on that aircraft. Because it's not the cost of the magazine. It's the cost of the fuel to transport the magazine back and forth. That's important. So when we talk about making things, you have to start thinking about what industry you're in. In the shipbuilding business, it's two cents a pound. <laughs> or in the railroad business, it's two cents a pound. It goes up by two orders of magnitude per industry, okay? Two cents a pound for the shipbuilding <coughs> business, or the railroad business, $2 a pound in the automotive business, $200 a pound in the, the uh, aircraft industry, and $20,000 a pound in the uh, space, space industry. So when people talk about joining, give me the context. What industry am I talking about? Aluminum's a wonderful material. A military aircraft, the Air Force, is not $200 a pound, it's $1,000 a pound. That's a higher performance vehicle. It goes faster than a commercial jet, okay? Remember, speed is important. I will pay more to reduce speed the faster I go. And it just goes back to one half MV squared, okay? Okay, gotta go to class. Thanks. <laughs>